Good evening, everyone. My name is Gail Mohel, and I'm the Exhibitions Curator at the Image Center. On behalf of the IMC, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight for Louis Pelou's lecture. I would like to acknowledge that the IMC is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee peoples. We embrace our shared ongoing responsibility for this land where our institution stands. Before I introduce Louis' show, I'd like to mention a few program notes. We are recording tonight's event and we'll be uploading it onto our YouTube channel in the near future for those who weren't able to attend tonight or for those who would like to watch again. After the lecture tonight, we will commence a Q&A. If you have questions throughout the lecture, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen to submit them. And lastly, in the case of a technical difficulty, please remain patient while we correct the issue. I'd like to introduce you to Louis' exhibition on view in our university gallery until December 9th. Between 1991 and 2003, Canadian photojournalist Louis Pelou established himself in the mining communities of Northeastern Ontario and Northwestern Quebec, where he documented the lives of the people or the mines and the formidable industrial architecture of the pits. This powerful body of work launched Louis' career as one of our leading documentary photographers. It is now my privilege to welcome Louis Pelou. Louis, over to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I just wanted to start by thanking you, Gail, for uh, uh, putting this uh, exhibition together and uh, being an incredible collaborator and partner in curating this show. I also want to thank Valerie Mateau. Uh, I remember, just so everybody knows, this this exhibition was delayed by the pandemic, and I remember Zooming with masks on as they were in my apartment. I was in a different city on assignment looking for prints and, and parts of the show. Uh, Paul Roth and the entire team at the Image Center, whom I have a relationship with spanning over 30 years so. Uh, thank you very much. And I also like to thank Stephen Bulger, uh, my gallerist, who has been an, a, a great friend for over 30 years and an incredible uh, support system for getting this show together. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, once in a while, if I pause, it's like I, Gail stayed on because it's like, oh, my God, where are all the people? I'm, I'm talking to my computer. Um, I'm just going to share a screen and I'm going to read a couple of things, you know, if if you went to the show, there's this really cool publication because I'm still into objects and print. I, pub I publish newspapers and there's a really incredible essay by Siobhan Angus, uh, daughter uh, of my, my writing partner doing the project, Charlie Angus. You have to get it. You can get it at the Image Center, nowhere else. Anyway, uh, here it is, unpublished stuff. I'll show some stuff from it. Um, just to get us orientated, uh, because now that I have my MFA, I, I'm going to read a little text. So uh, Cage Call, this is from Siobhan's essay. Cage Call is at its heart about photography itself, about the raw materials that make the medium possible and the environmental violence and physical labor that underlies that possibility. Just a little text for myself here because I couldn't memorize all of this. So see, it's like old school newspapers. An insight, from my longest journal, uh, an insight from my longest journalistic collaborator, Charlie Angus, was that an underground mine in its entirety can never be seen. It has to be imagined. From 1991 to 2000, 2003, I photographed Canadian mining communities in Northern Ontario and Quebec in all their tragedy and beauty. When I worked on this project, photography was in the pre-digital film era. My goal then, as it remains today, is for you to connect the materials you interact with daily to the issues and workers who produce them. Imagination and reality are constant themes in these images from the front lines of the international photographic economy. Nearly all my images taken from underground were made in the dark, illuminated by my flash. When I was taking the photographs, all I could see in the viewfinder was the white circle of the miner's headlamp. The rest of the frame was dark. Mostly, I could not see what I was photographing. I guess what was in my camera frame. If the drills were running, it was over 100 decibels of ear-shattering sound billowing a fog of dust and water mist in the air that was sometimes mixed with diesel exhaust from scoop trams. The workplace had no chairs. I sat mostly on heaps of blasted rock, slick with oil and water from the drills mist, a reminder of what we were breathing in down there. 
For more than a decade, I spent months underground in the dark with miners for entire eight to 12 hour shifts to witness and document every detail of the work. Though the majority of my and writer Charlie Angus's work were done independently in the 1990s, we conducted field work together on and off and most intensively during 2002 to 2003 before he entered federal politics. We collaborated on two books on mining, which are Industrial Cathedrals of the North and Cage Call, Life and Death in the Hard Rock Mining Belt. The photographs are an extensive archive and the majority of the images have never been published. More than 30 years since the start of this project when I was just out of arts college, this publication is a small, this one right here you can get at the Image Center. Uh, oh, I lost my spot. When I was just out of art college, this publication is a small sample of, of rare or unseen work that is not only about mining, but also about the politics of photography and our connections to it. It was always clear to me, mining and photography are inextricably intertwined Photography cannot exist without the minds, and we all digitally consume what they produce. The workers must be seen, not abstracted, and or ever only imagined. So anyway, let's get into some slides here. Uh, thanks for everybody for coming. I got to share the screen. There we go. I have some never before seen stuff. I made a really nice uh, artwork with a contact sheet for those of you who haven't seen a contact sheet in a while. Th this is generally what my contact sheets look like fogged out frames because there's so much mist in the air, couple of clear ones. Uh, so they're gonna get right into the slideshow. And I think what I'm gonna start with, let's see, just as I warm up and get into the groove of the talk here, uh, I'm gonna get into the, the time when I started this. Uh, there was no internet that we used when, when I did this project. You had to look things up in the phone book, you had to research, you had to go to libraries and pull, look books up on mining or mining companies to find phone numbers. Uh, I had just interned to Maryland Mark in New York. Uh, and you know, this is like the post Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher era. And you gotta understand that Canada kind of sits between those, the, the identities of those two countries politically and what was going on with, it was a post eighties economic crash. There was a lot of things going on around but workers. And just as there are many issues around things back then, uh, this is a portrait I did uh, of Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. Whoever, whoever doesn't know this, you should look him up. He was a, a Canadian uh, abortion doctor whose clinic was bombed in Toronto. Just think about, this is 1992, if you think there are things that are shocking now. And these things sort of positioned me how I was thinking about what politically was going on at the time what sides people are on, where, where I needed to be and where I need to be as an independent witness to document what was going on, what was important. So this is a never before, I did a lot of different portraits of people. I started out doing things like this. And I want you to see the frame to understand that I was shooting film. I think it's really important that we understand materiality. Uh, another project I did, which was just acquired by Library of Congress, is this project on uh, uh, workers killed by the exposure to asbestos and cancer. And just sort of giving you, before we get into the cage call work, sort of the kind of photographer I am and how I think and where I am, where I'm positioned and what, what I'm focused on. Uh, I covered the war in Afghanistan between 2006 and 2010. And that, that, was, that is composed of a number of photo essays during my coverage. Uh, but cage call really set up how I covered Afghanistan because I didn't do any assignments when I was in Afghanistan. I went there to do my own reportage and then I would go to magazines with the edit I thought was what reflected that I saw and that's how cage call I that's how I did cage call I never did any assignments uh, I did it independently uh, I covered the drug war in Mexico uh, uh, from let's see 2012 to about 2013 I covered like this about 140 assassinations in my first month there so Human rights, war, poverty, injustice, women's rights. These are things that are important to me. Uh, the importance of understanding. This is a, a woman who's just deported back to Mexico from the United States on the border. I think the narrative of, of women in terms of how we see uh, people being deported or civilians uh, that are displaced is very, very important narrative for me all the time when I do this kind of work. A uh, project I'm I'm working on right now is in the Arctic, the militarization of the Arctic. Uh, I've started it in 2015 and it's ongoing. Uh, I covered the January 6th insurrection and U.S. politics from the first impeachment of the, the Donald Trump all the way through to the aftermath to ongoing right now. 
And something I want to talk about before I get into the K-12 work is authorship. I think authorship is really important. I think knowing where you get your information and there that, you know, anyone who looks at pictures on social media, look at who the author is, the source of your images. So that's called a byline for people who don't know. Down, this is the out of BF, uh, the Globe and Mail, an article on detainees in, in prison and cap, the capturing of POWs in the war in Afghanistan. Authorship is important, I think. So um, this is a review uh, of the first body work that was published from the Cage Call Show uh, by John David Gravener from the National Post when it was a real newspaper. Such are the tyrannies of lucrative appetites. And this is the review he did. And so when I did Cage Call, I, I didn't know anything about photo editing. I wasn't taught photo editing. I went to art school. It was like single images or, or making a record of something. I didn't learn sequencing or editing. I kind of just thought I'd figure it out to what looked good, to be honest. Uh, and so uh, I published a book with Charlie Angus, Industrial Cathedrals of the North. But at the same time, I had a separate, it was the same project all along, but when, when, when I published it, a publisher was like, hey, we'll do a book of the architecture first. And I, I thought, hey, my first publishing deal. Great, 1999. But all the other work was, was happening at the same time. So here's a couple of spreads. And it existed more as like sort of a record, a history book with essays by Charlie in French and English. So these are all the buildings that sit over the mine shaft. This mine, just so we start understanding the scale of what's going on here. This mine alone, which this building is torn down now in Sudbury, the Frood mine supplied, I believe it's 40% of the nickel for, for all Allied artillery in the Second World War. Just so you understand where Canada's position in the global trade in metals and, and minerals. And people, when people talk about the Yukon Gold Rush, the Yukon Gold Rush produced maybe a million ounces of gold. Timmins, Ontario is over 100 million ounces and still going. So let's understand sort of the scale of the economies going on here, okay? And sort of where Canada's position and why Canada's G7 country. So, uh, you know, I thought it was really interesting, sort of the engineering, you know, and a lot of people talk of, of the Beshers, you know, and I just think that these are very different pictures than theirs. These are, are pictures of, of landmarks of engineering structures that are extracting these metals from the ground. Some of them were really fascinating sort of, this, this is in Northern Quebec. This is the Doyon mine or this. Oh, nearly all these buildings, and I think I photographed nearly a hundred are all torn down now. So when I first met Gail, I think she had just come to Canada. I saw her give a lecture and I thought I have to, I, I almost, she's going to laugh. I'm going to laugh because it's like, you know, I like her so much and it's it's a very affectionate thing to think of, but I seriously thought I have to work with this curator. Uh, I'd never heard someone talk like that about photography and she challenged everybody in the crowd. And I thought, this is really what I want. I want someone who challenges me. So just a little quote here that I think really captures something. As a whole, Cage Call aims at collecting an archive on a central but often overlooked and misunderstood part of Canada's industrial culture. So anyone here in this 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 talk who has a pension fund, you gotta understand that the bank or banks or investment company have stocks in these mining companies. And if you're a photographer or if you make photo prints or if you, you are a part of the photo anything, you are a part of mining. It's a part of everything. It's a part of everything we do. It's a part of your phones. It's a part of capitalism. It's a part of where we are now. And I thought that creating a record of it, Gail really captured really well it, it, with those words, what it really is. There are photo stories, photo essays, lots of different things, even sort of on the creative aesthetic art side. But as a whole, it's an archive. It's a record of something that we really need to all understand. So I had a lot of exhibitions in the mining towns and it was great because the families would come out and be like, oh my God, I'd never seen where my father or my husband works. You know, and it's mostly men who work in the mines. And I thought, wow, that's kind of shocking. But yeah, they don't get to go where they work. Uh, they hear about it and see it in photographs. And they had this show in Sudbury. And it, it, there, a whole controversy erupted because the companies were like, we don't like the way, you know, your historical, they're saying these are historical photos, like history is bad. You know, they made mining, mining careers a tough sell, you know. And going back to authorship, there's no author to this article. Like who wrote this? Is this opinion piece? What, what is this? Who planted this story? But, you know, if you look at the real the real sort of narrative here, 
uh, an article maybe seven or eight months later is that they're it's a very dangerous job it's a dangerous industry uh you know i think there was like four deaths in the mines earlier on but right away sort of it's a very political thing the way you represent mines and miners in towns like Sudbury, which have a long, violent labor history. Uh, but I think what's important is we're talking about stuff. It's always important to understand your history, whether you're in the mining industry or you're in journalism or art. Um, at first, people were like, "What's this is about poor workers and the romantic, oh, these poor, guy, poor people and their families. But really, it's, it's a bigger thing. It's about us as well in the photography world. The Globe and Mail started publishing this stuff first. So then it spread to like the this is the Virginia Quarterly Review, uh, and this was an article on the, the the future of the paperless world, the Canadian Geographic. Just so you understand how people are seeing the work. This is Geist out of the West Coast. This is Photo Eight in the UK. And so when you think of you know let's get what the title means, cage call. The cage is the elevator. That's the thing in this photograph that the, those miners are going into. And the call is the, the the gentleman at the bottom. He's the cage tender. He's calling them to get into the cage. It's the call to work. Okay. So cage call means the call to work. So this is the cage. This is at the Kerr mine in Virginia town. That's about seven hours north of Toronto by car. This is getting coming out of the cage. That's the head frame that they're in where the cage is. You see those, there's two little thin lines up in the middle. There's a wheel at the top. And that's like a hoist system that lifts the cage up and down. You know, it's about 3,000 feet deep in shaft number one. This is the smelter. So all your recycling goes to a place like this. This is a smelter. That's like two football fields. This is in Falcon Bridge. Okay. And this is a gold mine. This is a small scale gold mine. And a lot of this kind of mining still happens like this. And a lot of it doesn't. A lot of it is mechanized and high tech now but people still have to go underground to do a lot of the work. Timbering happens a little bit, but not so much anymore. This was a time when I did this project in the nineties, it was a time of change. So when I'm taking this picture, see the little lamp on the guy's helmet. All I can see is that. Now I have my lamp kind of in my hand, but there's no autofocus. It's medium format. It's 12 exposures. I'm in the dark. I kind of have like my lamp shining around and I'm, you know, they're moving around and I have to stay in one spot so they don't hit me with something or I, I don't fall down a hole or I get crushed or, or hit with wood. So a lot of the pictures when I'm underground, I can't see. Um, a lot of the themes like it's underground in work, life, daily life in town. This is a retired miner at one of the Italian clubs playing an accordion, sort of stories of immigrants and, and, and life, social life around the mining community accidents this is Huey he was a miner who fell down a shaft and was paralyzed you know and, and a lot of these relationships were built over many many years I, I probably spent about 12 years doing the field work uh, it probably may have been shorter but uh, I'm glad it took that long only because I just come out of school and I knew what I was doing to a degree but it was I was learning who I was and how I wanted to document or or say something about what I was seeing and what I was hearing this is Bill Whelan. He has his arm. And this is a real reality of, of, of dangerous jobs. The most, the most dangerous work in, you can do in Canada where there are deaths is construction, actually. Uh, but mining is up there. And uh, I, I know that Bill goes around to mines and teaches safety, like this could happen to you kind of thing. So this is Lola Angus, the youngest of Charlie's daughters. This isn't the playground near our house. That's a mine head frame in the background. This is in Cobalt where in the early days, sorry, I clicked that too quick. Uh, a lot of the silver for Kodak came from Cobalt, Ontario. It was one of the biggest silver mining, uh, mining camps in the world. So a lot of what you're seeing here, this history and, and, and these pictures and these places that are real places just north of Toronto, you know, all those vintage prints that we have in our collections come from these places. This story is a part of photography. So this is a, a men's men's wear. I really, really felt like I looked at it and there's like a face, you know, there's a little eye on the left, the larders men's wear, and then the nose in the middle with the mouth, at the bottom of the door. I, I, I didn't see that at first. I, I was driving a snowmobile actually. Uh, 
which isn't uncommon up there. I was driving a snowmobile to someone's house and I thought, whoa, that looks, you know, I felt I studied Walker Evans. I thought, and then I took the photo and then a photo editor pointed it out actually that, that they, and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, couple of slides, just so you see, uh, prints on the wall, four, four walls, some quotes from Charlie's interviews, uh, and then some ephemera. I'll get into details of what that is. Some book dummies, uh, and those little uh, cards and some union booklets there. I'll, I'll talk about those in a sec. This is a different view facing the other way. Really, really incredible installation. And I never thought of the quality of the prints because they were in a print box. And I thought, okay, technically check. These are technically good, well-made prints. And people say, these prints are so good. And I thought, I never thought of it like that until I saw them on the wall. And I thought, oh, because they were just, for me, they were like, okay, if it's good or bad, there's nothing in the middle. So uh, anyway, it was a nice surprise. I hadn't really looked at these on a wall in a long, long time. So, you know, um, my job as a journalist uh, and, and a person who's into, you know, sort of collecting the facts and truth, um, it, it's really important to understand how to go into the field and collect things. And when one of the mines went uh, bankrupt, the Caradison gold mine, uh, there is all this stuff they threw away in the garbage and it abandoned um, and I found these employee cards with a lot of important information. And it's incredible when you look on the back, it says, uh, Father in Rouen, so his father's in Northern Quebec, RC, he's Roman Catholic, so they're keeping a record of people's religion. Um, and the x-ray is okay. That means they x-rayed their, their lungs, most likely for silicosis, which was a major, especially back then, uh, lung disease. And these practices obviously are outlawed now, um, but it isn't. They are, they are outlawed mostly because of the work of unions. And now, thankfully, some progressive mining companies who don't want don't want to be associated with this kind of, of, of sort of operating a company. But imagine so your health status and your religion being whether you get hired or kept on or not. So really important documents. Um, I want to show this picture of prints. I want you to look at the wrinkles of the paper. I think it's important because we're in a digital world. And after this lecture is done, you know, there's a, a, a video somewhere and that's a valuable document. Um, but, but actual materiality, I think is really important. How these prints are made, uh, how they're archived, how the di di digital anything is the world of the unknown in the future in terms of preserving things. But when I did this project and still now, this is about making prints about making physical things that you interact with, that you go to a gallery and the curator like Gael uh, curates it and there's physical objects to look at and you dedicate time to think of how you're a part of this world and how you're a part of mining and or photography and that it's made of paper and silver and someone made that and I'm acknowledging that and I think it's really important to understand that these aren't just JPEGs in a slideshow. So I just, you know, I have lots and lots and lots of prints. Uh, book dummies, uh, I gotta say, when I, I had no idea, I, I sort of knew how to pick the best picture. I was okay at that, but doing a 50 picture edit is something very, very different. And uh, I immediately knew I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I went to start seeing photo editors. I work at the Globe and Mail, so I got orientated. But photo editors at newspapers and magazines usually go to like 10, 50, maybe 20 photos. You know, I've done some big ones recently with Nash Geo, like over 50, but at the you know finding a book editor is a, a different a different story and uh i went to see you know i had to the internet wasn't really around you know at, at the time i went to see ken light he teaches at berkeley and i took a workshop with him and he workshopped some of the edit and then uh i got invited to visa prolemage in france i i swear i think everything leads back to france in terms of photo history and i was really lucky i met john g morris there john g morris uh obviously the first photo editor of, of Magnum, worked at the Washington Post and the New York Times, was a groundbreaking sort of a photo editor, uh, really taught me a lot about photo editing. I'm going to show you a couple of things. And I, I use laser copies and, and Epson prints. Uh, I think it's really important. I, you, I don't think you can see a full edit on your screen. You got to see it big. You got to see it like you're going to touch it and hold it, you know. So this is the 50 picture edit for the book for Cage Call. And uh, we talked about ideas, you know, John and I, and I was really lucky I got to know him. Uh, we hung out a few times and he just talked about 
Um, how are you introducing the people to the audience and how's the audience experiencing going to the mine? So he felt like just drop them right down into the mine, really drop them down. Don't let them see any faces. So when you finally come up from the mine, you're in the town and right away you realize there's two things in the, that run the town, the mine in the background and the church. Those are the, you know, and the mine is almost taller than the church. He taught me about anchor images and, uh, you know, Chris Killips in Fragante, I think is one of the best sequenced photo books ever. There's a lot of great ones, but for me, it's fantastic. And he did this kind of anchoring where you introduce someone at one point and just you know, these two red slides, these images are uh, sort of the in and the out of the town, you know? So, and the cause and the effect. And I think it's super, super important to understand sort of the experience in between. So this is probably one of the most, more well-known images. Uh, I think it's like a four, eight second exposure. There's no digital photography. It was 400 ISO. I didn't have a tripod. I got lowered 2,500 feet down in that thing on the left there. And uh, uh, I used a barrel and a piece of rock to hold my camera down. And the, the guy was yelling up the shaft for them to lower some stuff because they were going to keep sinking the shaft. This is the vertical shaft. To, this is the beginning of the mine. So you can only photograph this process once. And this is, this is the leaving the town image from the anchor. So you sort of pull back and the town's disappearing and it's only about the mine. And, you know, I, I think that when you're sequencing and editing, I think it's really, really important to understand these sorts of, of, of aesthetics. And I'm going to talk about a few more. So th this is another one, sort of the light from the right, the light from th the smelter shining to the next page, echoes off the page. These are all real important photo editing aesthetics, you know, that should, shouldn't be lost. You know, I, I can't really find these in books. This is pretty straightforward. Scale, you know, large and small. Texture you know, echoes of shapes like the two foam poles, the two smokestacks, the land, the land with the people on it, the land with the people off it, you know. Um, also in term printers, no one talks about printers. This is my uh, longtime printer, Andre Laredo, who passed away last year. This is us at Gallery 44 making, these are 30 by 40 prints uh, for the Harry Ransom Center. I, I didn't take any images really like this of us printing uh, some of the cage call stuff, but uh printers and learning how to print. Uh, I make Epson prints, I make digital prints, but I think that uh, um, if, if you really take a look at the prints at this exhibition, uh, I really think that uh, it, ink is just not silver. It's not the same. Anyway, uh, just, I think process important. Uh, I'm, I'm still very interested in miners and workers. This is me in Ukraine with my fixer interviewing coal miners in Donetsk for a film I made a few years back. And again, authorship, being there in person, you know, you being a reader, understanding, hey, who who took this photo? Who made this film? Who wrote this? Where did my information come from? I think that authorship is hugely important. I found this the other day. So this is the miner saying, hey, you go sit where I was and I'm going to take your photo. I found this on a contact sheet the other day. This is 24-year-old Louis. Uh, so I, I sat on those rocks that a pile of rock like that in the dark all day. This is lit by flash. Without the flash, all you'd see is a little white light on the on the helmet there. So that's kind of the clothing you wear underground. Just a really nice quote before I start wrapping up the talk from Siobhan Angus. Silver and gold mines are the front line of the stock market and from the material possibilities of the image. Just, you know, I sent a copy of the newspaper to David Burnett, another great friend and mentor who's been very generous in, in sharing a lot of his insights with me. And he said, you know, I read Siobhan Angus's essay and I, I you know, it makes you really think about that little box, the yellow, yellow box of Tri-X and where it comes from. You, know, you never really think about that. Um, this is, if you, if you don't get a chance to get the publication, it's, it's at, at the image center. This is what it looks like. It's all unpublished. And, and I will say my, my wife, Chloe Coleman, who, who's also my photo editor for nearly everything I do, I'm like, how did I not put these in the photo edit? But this is why you need to interact with curators and photo editors more. Um, so these are images that have never been seen or published before, really. 
So I did shoot some six by seven before I went only square. That's a, the square thing is a whole other conversation. But just so you know, this was a mine. This this is the leftover. Those are 30 foot trees up there in cobalt where the silver came from. Mostly there's a ladder at the bottom there. Just to so you understand, this is just a, a little sample of what 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 it looked like. Some of the it, it, uh, the extraction of silver. This is a, this was a silver vein that's a few feet wide and probably a hun over 100 feet deep. It was like a silver, like a sidewalk. There was a, a place actually called the Silver Sidewalk. And just in terms of like strong photo editing, just a, a couple of examples with Chloe edited this. And this is a uh, picket line in Sudbury. Uh, it, it really struck me the size uh, of the people that the mind, the, how the minds transform people's bodies to have to do that kind of work. And sort of the emotion they have of the attachment to what they do when people try threatening their job, you know. And I just thought this pairing, this is, you know, re really strong photo editing. Uh, you know, you go to a, an event and there's like the widow's table, you know, that really hits you. Like you're going to a dinner and they're in a mining town and there's a widow's table. By the way, uh, that little hand sticking in the left, that's Charlie Angus's hand with his little notebook taking notes. Little, little, little behind the scenes stuff. These are some miners. That's Pete Sale in the middle. Uh, Pete was a, a very kind and incredible man. He he took me underground to a lot of places and, show, and taught me a lot about mining. Uh, and this pairing is, you know, quite powerful. So I did a lot of portraits. A lot of times I did portraits because I wanted photos that looked out at you too, that where you you were forced to meet the people. Uh, this is Shaggy, his nickname, because he looked like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. I don't know if anyone didn't grow up on that cartoon. You can look it up. But Shaggy, I spent a lot of time with him. A lot of the miners would be like, Louie, come underground with us today. You know, no, no, come with us. And it was like a, con you know, and it, the access was incredible. I don't think there'll ever be anything like that. Basically, there was a geologist named Frank Ploger. Uh, an incredibly kind and cultured man who thought, you know, the arts and the mind should sort of, there should be something together to do with that. And he thought, why don't you come and photograph this for history? Because it's going to disappear, right? You know, a lot of mining companies are afraid of this kind of photography, and they shouldn't be, uh, because we need to record our history. Or there's no record of it. Uh, so I think... Uh, I, he said, hey, come underground. And then after a while, he's like, look, why don't we just safety train you and you can just walk around wherever you want. So I walked around and I learned all the tunnels. I used to climb up and down ladders, up manholes with my camera bag on my head, you know, to go to other, I'd be walking all over the mine. I had a little map on all the tunnels, thousands of feet in different places. Um, anyway, I, some miners I spent a lot of time with. This is uh, Lester Beatty. He's passed away. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Some miner at the Macassa mine, which is in Kirkland Lake. And, you know, I, I I have a print of this. I got to say, I looked at the, it's an 11 by 14. And I, I was really lucky, you know, Agfa, when, when, at the twilight of the end of, of Agfa, they're like, let's make the most silvered paper ever. And I made a print with that paper, this hand, and just the way it's lit with the fingerprints is pretty remarkable. I think it's the grease in the hand, which really accentuates it. But uh, this is a picture of a miner from Sudbury of his hand. I found some images like this that just, you know, have so many meanings that you can attach to it. This is at the Kerr mine. So this is an area where blasted rock from a work area comes down, and then someone comes in with a, 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 a machine and loads this blasted rock into a little rail car and brings the blasted rock to the shaft, goes up the shaft to the mill, they crush it, and they process it with a chemical to get the gold out. That's simplifying it, but, and this is the ore car dumping the blasted rock, or it's called muck, uh, down, down an ore chute. This is a really, another nice spread with Chloe. So anyone out there who I've worked with, you'll know Chloe is nicknamed the submarine photo editor, because before you get an edit, Chloe's like the unseen photo editor underwater. So she is pretty brilliant. And just sort of wrap up, I, I really felt like these looked like, you know, like mining, like whalers, like sort of these twilights. Sort of like these, these are called slickers. They're at oil because when you drill with water, 
there's oil in it so the drills don't get stuck. But obviously that's a mist in the air and you're breathing it in, but it slowly makes a film over other bodies. Almost it's it's like like if you've seen the old film with Gregory Peck of Moby Dick, it's got this whaling quality, this, you know, this resource extraction sort of feeling. I just want to, before I wrap up, just use this last quote from Charlie. This lack of representation is perhaps a reflection of the alienation of the North from the, I always say this word really badly, so he hegemony, hegemony, hegemony of Southern urbanization. You know, and really, like, if you're from Toronto, if you've never been to Kirkland Lake or Sudbury or Timmins, you should take a ride up there because a lot of the labor laws that protect you now were fought for not only by unions, I'm not being pro-union, this is the fact, but by strikes in Cobalt and, and Kirkland Lake and Sudbury and Timmins and Elliott Lake, all these labor laws, like how many days you work, all this sort of stuff is was were fought for in these kinds of places. And sort of a last parting thing is how we think of photography and how purest we can think of it. This was from an assignment I did for an actual magazine and there was a strike in Sudbury and this is not a part of the project, it's part of the archive, I guess. These are strike breakers. These are private security guards used to intimidate workers who are on strike. And they film you with the camera. And we are in an age where cameras are weapons, serious weapons. And they're filming me taking their picture, making a record of me. But also the miners on strike are taking photos of all the, the, the co-workers or other workers who are crossing the picket line. And they had a book of what they called scab pictures. This is in a binder at the union hall. So, you know, conflict using photography. And I think that that's just a nice, fascinating way to end the, the chat. And I'll just turn the share screen off. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, there's one you alluded to it, but maybe um, we can go back. It's about accessing the, mm -hmm. uh, the locations. Um, how was it arranged for you to go down to the mines and have access to other parts of the work site? Mm -hmm. um, so, did you have any um, big negotiations, or was it just? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, uh, obviously, the first thing is is anytime these companies, and I'm gonna just put myself in the company's shoes. Anytime, it's a very dangerous place. You can't just walk around on the mine site. You could get killed, and then they're responsible, and no one wants. Uh, someone getting killed at their workplace. Uh, they have very strict safety rules for a reason. Uh, and uh, so if you come there as a visitor, someone has to take you around. So they are watching you and, you know, no one, no one ever said, don't take a photo of that. That never happened to me at the mines. Uh, and uh, obviously you have to pay that person. And obviously if you go to places, they have to stop working. So that costs money. So, they're, they're real things. It's not like they're trying, a lot of times not trying to hide something, but it just, it costs money and an, a full, an employee to take you around. Uh, so uh, there were mining companies that said no, and I never got access. Uh, there are mining companies that I asked for many years and then they gave me one tour. There is uranium mines never were going to let me in. And then the union put it in their collective agreement that they had to take me underground to take photographs. So, and I remember when I, I, I came, they brought me to the mine manager's office and the mine manager said, see, he's here and we're keeping our agreement. And it, he wasn't friendly about it, actually. It was like, okay, good. And then I went underground. Um, so some, you know, a lot of the abandoned mine sites is not really a, a problem. Uh, some companies are like, sure, here, we'll give you a letter. Just hop the fence. I'm not kidding. That's what some of the mining, this, uh, this would probably not happen now, but you know, that was a time where a lot of old abandoned mine sites uh, were just fenced off and the company would just pay like a minimal tax. And then a law came in. And that's why I photographed all the buildings. We published a book, the Industrial Cathedrals book, was a law came in that mining companies had to return all their mine sites or properties to their original state. Or they're going to pay this huge fine or fee or tax or something like that. And so they're like, hey, let's tear everything down and clean everything up. Plus, you know. Uh, this was a good thing. A lot of mining companies were like forced to like start. They couldn't open another mine because the government's like the last time you opened a mine, you made this environmental mess. And so mining companies find it now being a, a good global citizen, even with and very responsible with the environment pays if they need a permit, you know, so 
they tore all those buildings down and a lot of those mines ended up either finishing out mining and then they, they had to return it. So, uh, so that access was that some of the ones I spent more time at, uh, mostly like the Kerr mine, it was a smaller company and they, they, they were interested in the history. They're interested in the history. And then I just, I got a subscription to the mining news. And then I would just be like, Oh, look, they're building a mine. And I said, Hey, I'm doing a history project. Uh, uh I want to photograph the sinking of that mine shaft. And they're like, sure. And I'd say now it's probably a lot harder to get or impossible to get access. They're like, sure, show up, talk to this guy and he'll take you down the shaft. So I remember showing up for that shaft photo. And I literally, I got to the gate and they said, yep, go see this manager. I went inside the head frame. He goes, okay, great. Put on your hard hat, get dressed. And then literally the shaft door opened and I, they said, get on. And I had to hang on to this chain and get lowered down 3000 feet. It was like so fast and like, okay, like, Hurry up. We got to get to work. Get out of our way. You know, um, so the access, you know, I think it was a unique time. I think, mm -hmm. you know, now it's it's very, very different. Mm -hmm. But uh, strikes, Another, I had to yeah. talk to unions because obviously the union doesn't know who you are. And you could you could get you could get beat, strikes, get violent. You could get beaten up. Um, so I would get that, a letter from the union. That, that ties to a, another question which is about how did you gain the trust of the miners? Um, mm -hmm. How long did it take? What were the challenges if you had any? I think what was important was authorship and knowing like that the authenticity of what I was doing, that I was actually who I was. So, you know, back then, I don't even know if there were websites when I started this, I had a box of prints and I would like call up the union and say, you know, they couldn't go online and look you up. So I would call the union and say, hi, this is my name. And I would take literally a 16 by 20 box or eight by 10. They start getting smaller and I'd go in and I would lay the prints out and I would say, this is what I'm doing. And I think they realized the kind of photos I was doing that I wasn't doing PR photographs or color tourist photographs. I think they understood right away. And uh, I engaged with some of the local museums as well and said, Hey, I can have a show here of the mine in your town. Uh, but then as time went on, I did build relationships uh, and I think it, it just, I, I would go to union meetings uh, just, and I just kept going so people can get to know me. I had exhibitions in town uh, and uh, I think a, a lot of times some unions took time because they couldn't do a background check on you. They have no idea if I'm a, a company spy, which in the decades of history, there were company spies, you know, infiltrating unions. Uh, so uh, it just took a lot of time. And then as I got to know them, I, if there was a strike, I could call up the union president and say, hey, it's Louis calling. I want." And as I got published, they would see my name and they would associate me, my authorship with journalism. So they knew I was an independent person. I was not with a company. I was not someone else. I was a journalist. And that meant something to them. So I think that coming back to authorship and being, my intentions were genuine. Um, I have a, well, it's the usual question, but I think in this case, it's, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, why did you uh, shoot black and white? And I think it's so interesting because now mm -hmm. you talk so much about the materiality and it makes sense yeah. today that you shot black and white, but at the time, were you aware that it would be connected that much? Well, I'll just be the honest. Medium and the topic? Yeah. I mean... Uh, I, I don't think I was a very good color photographer at the time. I, I'd worked for a lot of photographers who did black and white, but black and white, it's the poor person's, you know, material too. like color, color. You can't process that on your own. You got to go to a lab that costs lots of money making prints. You have to go to a lab that costs lots of money. I had, I had a dark room on Brock Avenue, Brock and queen. I mean, this is in the early nineties when going, you went past, if you pass Bathurst, man, Queen West was like the Badlands back then. Uh, so in Toronto, so I have to say where it is in case people are not from Toronto. But yeah, I had a, I had an old studio space I shared with a, a friend who graduated from from art college with me, and we built a dark room. I built a sink. You know, color you need a machine. I'm so a lot of it started from that. But I'll be honest, looking back, color was very hard. It was a lot more complex with lighting. You know, at the time when I think of, and we got to think about 
back in the that time, like the the color photographers were like Susan Mizellis's Nicaragua work, uh, Bruce Davidson's Subway work. When we think of color, you know, I mean, there's many other kind color, but you know, Alex Webb's work. Some that was like the groundbreaking sort of like slide film and underground. Just technically, I, I just didn't have the money. It just and I could process it on my own, and it was very straightforward and aesthetically. It, it wasn't out of my reach. Color would have been, you know, I, I think of as well, like, you know, Joel Meyerowitz, very controlled, but underground, it's just, I, I every time I make a mistake, it costs me a fortune, 12 pictures per roll of film. Um, are you thinking of um, continuing this work in um, in a different form or with a different, you know, approach like this? aspect of uh, linking mm -hmm. the materiality of photography with you know the industrial topic um i think i'm more aware of the materiality especially because i mean mostly because i'll be honest i always thought of it in a very simple way like hey do you know where that comes from it, it was that simple but then i read one of siobhan's essays and i've known siobhan angus since she was uh, a, a girl uh, and and I've really enjoyed watching her blossom into a PhD art historian. Uh, She's listening. She's with she us. She is. She is. And uh, it's it's so uh, it's such a gift to work with her, you know. Uh, and uh, it, it it's a consciousness shift moment, you know. I really felt like it was a, a battle, you know, like it's a fight. Like I'm I'm picking a fight with things, like. You know, my parents had grade four. They were Italians. They were grade four immigrants, grade four reading level, sorry, I meant. And, you know, that right away positions you somewhere in society, workers, you know. And I really felt like uh, what people make and where it goes and who gets to have it and who doesn't and who has the money to buy it and who doesn't, I think is a really important thing to understand. And, and it was very simple for me at the time, but Siobhan's writing really expanded the way I thought of materiality. And I I, I would I, I have been thinking, I have some concepts of going back up to the mining towns. I was a very baby photographer when I started that project. I, my my abilities are, are much greater now. And I if I found the right partner or commissioner, I, I might even do color work. You know, I did do an entire scene in the coal mine in, in Donetsk when I made my film on Ukraine. So in terms of moving image, I really felt uh, a, a satisfaction because I tried shooting some super eight back then. I have a few minutes of it. It's, you know, just, it's, it, it can't be turned into really into anything, but uh, from the cage call, but the, the getting the coal miners in Ukraine was getting a moving image piece for it. I would like to go back up north, but obviously funding, time, these sorts of things. So I would like to do it. I have to find the right partner. What I'd like to do is publish a, a full book of the this the, the contact sheet. I mean, it's the it, the stack of negatives. You you and Val had to go into my apartment on Zoom and look through all my. I mean, it's bottomless, you know. So I I'd like to do a, a real book, but obviously that is an undertaking. So. And uh, maybe last question, um, what are you working on uh, right now? What are your projects? Oh, what am I working on right now? So two two things. Uh, one is, let's just say it's now the industrialization of the Arctic. You know, if you're Canadian, your identity is, you know, I live in America now. So, you know, we're outside of like Hawaii and Alaska and those outer parts of the empire, there's four sides. You can like France or you know Europe. You can drive the circumference of the country pretty much. Canada, you drive not even too far, and then it's sort of the roads end, and then there's this other massive part of it's this great unknown. I've grown to like the cold. You know, I grew up ice fishing, I hockey. I've grown to like winter as a part of who I am. I like being uncomfortable in the cold. Uh, so I, I do think what's happening in the Arctic. We're seeing the end of, of this representation of the Arctic uh, as this pristine, uninhabited place. And there's a lot going on, and some of it's related to the war in Ukraine. So I am working on, on the Arctic. I'm working in every country, except Arctic country, except Russia, because of what's going on right now. 
But also right now, and yesterday I was on Capitol Hill, is I have a very, very big project. That's, let me just say it's about democracy or the collapse of it is uh, in 2019. I wanted nothing to do with the last U.S. president, but then the impeachment came up, the first one. I thought, let me do one project. This is how it always starts. The, my, the cage call started. It's supposed to be a one-month portrait project, the curse of being an artist. And I thought, I'll do one essay on the impeachment, and then I'm oh, that's it, because it's an important moment. And then it just kept going. 2020 happened. The pandemic. George Floyd was murdered. The protests in front of the White House. Legions, like Roman legions of police, marching past my apartment. You know, the White House is a 15 minute bike ride from my, my apartment right here. So uh, and I covered everything up through and I was at the Capitol on January 6th. So I'm really connecting it. And and it's special again, because I'm talking to Gail here, because I think that it has a precedent in the history of photography uh, with France and some of the first photographs of insurrections and, and, and barricades. And I think that these moments are really prescient and important to understand sort of what photography has done, what accomplished politically and how we understand our world and how we document it. So uh, it's just sort of, uh, it's political year zero. If you want to see part of it, it's a world press photo project from 2022. It's called political. You can just look it up if you want to see 30 sample pictures from it. So that's what I'm working on. All right. Well, thank you so much, Louis, for uh, this great thank you. talk and this great conversation. Uh, we're very happy um, that you were able to be with us tonight. Thank you um, also for your great work. And the exhibition is on view until December 9th. Um, and I uh, hope you can all come and see um, our current exhibitions at the Image Center. Thank you so much, Louis. Thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Gail.